Today's show will be all about sex, hedonism, and free love because I've got a month left of bachelorhood and I need tips on how to really live it up. And speaking of hippie communes, today is May Day, which is celebrated by pagans and communists alike. Lucky for us in the United States, we celebrate a very different holiday today, which we'll get to in this day in history. Finally, on cults and culture, new studies reveal an epidemic of hatred and loneliness in America. But first, we have Bridget Phetasy in studio, writes for The Federalist and Playboy, and spent time in the very sex cult featured in Wild Wild Country. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. A lot to get to today. Sex, communes, cults bad culture, uh, why Americans are lonely and they hate each other. We have a little bit of hope at the end, but I want to get straight to the sex. So let's very quickly, (laughs) you know, speaking of these two sort of relate, I won't go too into it. We have to thank one of my favorite sponsors, Wink. Wink is a wonderful sponsor because Wink sends me wine. And that that puts them right at the top of the heap just for that. Uh, Wink is a wonderful product. You have to check it out right now. So let me give you a task. Pick out a wine that you're going to love, but here's a catch. You haven't had it before. How do you do that? Because what I do is I go to the liquor store, the wine store, and I see a gazillion wines and I know absolutely nothing whatsoever about it. And then I spend a lot of money and I don't love it. Or sometimes I miss those great wines that aren't that expensive and they're perfect for me. Wink solves all of these problems. W-I-N-C, Wink. It makes it easy to discover great wine. This is a very important thing. Life is too short for bad wine. Only drink great wine and don't bankrupt yourself while you're doing it. You can get wonderful, uh, wonderful deals on wine. Uh, Wink's wine experts select wines matched to your taste, personalized for you, shipped right to your door, starting at just $13 per bottle. Forget the two buck Chuck fellas. This is a, this is 2018. Treat yourself white, right, <laughs> right with wine. Life is too short. There is nothing like coming home to a delicious box of Wink wine. All these beautiful bottles arrayed out, selected just for you. And what you do is you go on, you take the palate profile quiz. So usually for me, they say, do you like wine? I say, yeah. How do you like it? Wet. And then they send it to me. But they have really specific questions that can tell you a lot about your palate. So, you know, how do you take your coffee? Do you like salt? Do you like citrus? You know, that, that kind of thing. Each month, Uh, Wink sends you new delicious wines curated to your taste, such as the insanely popular Summer Water Rosé. Listen, fellas, don't be too proud to have a little rosé. Rosé makes the day. Uh, Shipping is covered. There are no membership fees. You can skip any month. You can cancel any time. There is no reason not to try this. Up your wine game. You have to do it. If you don't like a bottle they send you, they'll just replace it with a bottle you'll love. No questions asked. Discover great wine today. Go to trywink.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, like Jay-Z's wife. You will get $20 off your first shipment. I am I'm giving you a wonderful gift, folks. Don't turn it down. T-R-Y-W-I-N-C dot com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. $20 off. Trywink.com slash Knowles. Okay, we've got to get right into this. I want to jump right into the sex cults. If you haven't seen this, I think this is the biggest show on Netflix right now, Wild Wild Country. It's about the Rajneeshi cult that was in Oregon and they took over a city basically and they all wore orange or red and had a lot of sex and followed this crazy Indian guy. If you haven't seen it, here's just a little bit of the trailer. Everybody felt they were there at the beginning of the great experiment. Like we were the chosen people. <laughs> A prominent Indian guru and his followers bought it. Bhagwan's agenda was simply to raise the consciousness of humanity. That was his goal. They're run by satanic power. There is talk of vigilantes who may seek revenge on the Rajneeshis. If I didn't take measures to protect our community, no one else would do it. We call upon the governor to disarm this cult's army now. Who would poison a whole town? The Rajneeshis. They were facing immigration fraud, smuggling. The Rajneeshis came this close to murdering a presidential appointee. There's darkness in all of us. Doesn't make you a bad person. 
that menacing laugh at the end. That is the Rajneeshi cult. And coincidentally, you, you might have seen Bridget Phetasy. You might have read her writing on The Federalist or Playboy.com, which I only read for the articles. Mm-hmm. You, you might have seen her there. I think Bridget is actually the only person <laughs> that writes for both The Federalist and <laughs> Playboy.com. It, before her, it was just Bill Buckley. <laughs> coincidentally, Bridget actually spent about a month on a Rajneeshi sex cult in Australia. Not the one in Oregon, but they have these all over the world. And she spent it uh, on one in Australia. We're joined right now by Bridget Fetisi. Bridget, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So you, it's my wheelhouse. We, you know, I, I love your writing. <laughs> Thank you. Coincidentally, you happen to experience probably the biggest TV phenomenon I in know. person, <laughs> up close, maybe up a little too close. I, I didn't think I would ask this question on, on the Michael Knowles show. What made you join a sex cult? <laughs> Um, it was an accident. It wasn't intentional. <laughs> That's what they all say, Bridget, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was an accident for a month. Um, it, it, I was traveling. I, I, I had booked a one-way ticket and just tra- wanted to put a backpack on and travel. And I went with this guy that I'd met in Sydney. We went up to the coast and it was their holidays. And he assured me that there would be a place to stay in yeah. Byron Bay. And I got there and there was nowhere to stay. And he was having a boys weekend. So he, being not a gentleman, was basically like, you're on your own, girl I just met. Bridget, I don't know if that's not, like, just being not a gentleman. (laughs) Like, if I'm not a gentleman, maybe I don't pick up the tab at dinner or something. But I've never ditched my date for a sex cult. (laughs) And so I I ended up looking on uh, woofing. I was subscribed to all these different sites like couch surfing and woofing and I looked on Woofing and they had an ad for, it was just like a spiritual retreat is what they called and it. And Woofing is, that's the organic farm. Woofing so. is worldwide organic farming. If you're traveling on a budget, it's a great way to go around and you work four hours a day for somebody on a farm and then you can go do whatever you want. Um, if you're, you're, it's a good way to get around the world in places like Chile and New Zealand in particular and Australia. And then I I was like, oh, spiritual retreat. That sounds, you know, harmless enough. And I went and and they they said, oh, there's a car in town right now getting supplies. We can pick you up today. And I said, perfect. Right. And then they showed up and they were all in white with the beads and crazy eyes. And did did they, they all had crazy eyes? They definitely had that that mm-hmm. like the look yeah. where it's just I don't know if it is just the brainwashing that happens that your eyes it's like disconnected a little bit and they showed up and I got in the car and you know at some point I'm I have a ch- very storied past and I sometimes do things I'm a writer and sometimes I make decisions because I'm like oh this will be a cool story <laughs> and who knows but then I realize you know I'm taking my life in my own hands right and it might be dangerous and I ended up uh, in the car and the guy was driving like a maniac really aggressively through all these windy back roads and I was like wow I, I might never see my family or friends again I could just disappear no one knew where I was. I mean, it was, it was reckless. You're in the middle of Australia. You're and you don't have communication tools, right? Not really. I had, you know, a little like flip phone that I bought when I started traveling, but it wasn't, you know, this was before it there I don't even think Airbnb was a thing yet. Mm. It wasn't too long ago. It was 2012, but it wasn't like it is now. Now you get there, because mm-hmm. I've, I've seen the show. The show is really good, Wild Wild Country, if you check it out. <laughs> How similar is it? How, what, what is this, the Australian <laughs> version it was like? Pretty sim- it wasn't, I mean, the scenes that you see that are really graphic, it was funny because I walked into the living room and my roommate was watching it and she, and I was like, hey, I've done that. And it was them doing the dynamic meditation. And she was like, of course you have, Bridget. What are you talking about? This is a documentary. And I was like, no, I was on an ashram that did all of this stuff. What is this? And then she was telling me, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the guy who started, he's the guy that had the whole, um, it was the whatever, the what we practiced on the ashram. Yeah. It was his, we listened to his tapes and we did the dynamic meditation, which is a meditation that he invented. And it's, um, it wasn't like as raw and aggressive and naked and kind of crazy. I but... didn't want to pry, but uh, yeah, I, I wanted to know it, it, on all of these other uh, 
ashrams that are still in existence today, are they all having weird, bizarre sitar music tantric sex? Um, yes and no. So most ashrams, Osho kind of, he rejected the traditional ashram aesthetic and he was very, he said it's not all about just denial, it's about embracing. He had this whole thing called Zorba the Buddha where you can you can meditate but you can also drink and be mm. wild and crazy and have sex and you don't have to renounce all these things to be spiritual. In fact, spirituality and sexuality are linked you know, you can't, you can't really untangle them and encourage polyamory and all of this kind of partner swapping. And, and yeah, I, I think that most ashrams that you go to come from a strict lineage. I went to another one in New, in New Zealand and it was, you know, the golden silence from eight until eight and kirtan in the morning, but it was with meditation and it was very strict and you, it was the complete opposite. So I think those that Osho ashrams are are their own little culture. Now, who is running this thing in Australia? So it's not the Bhagwan Indian guy that no. lived in Oregon. Who's the guy in <laughs> Australia? Was, I, it was a guy named Samaya, but it was a, I think he was an Italian trust fund baby. Of That's what I've was. come of to find he out. Was, he was yeah. Italian. That mm, note to self: <laughs> When Ben fires you, don't, yeah, okay, go be, start a call. Uh-huh, it seems yeah, it seems like a pretty. <laughs> good gig to I, have. Seriously. I like how you can kind of just go retreat and then come and everyone's like, oh, yay. But most of the time you just kind of spend alone. I think he just watched TV. I yeah. don't know what he was doing that's, that's all that time alone. Nice work if you can get it. The Bhagwan spent a lot of time alone. Mm-hmm. It seems like he was isolated a lot. Did you? So I'm, I'm wondering how this Italian guy did it. Is there a brainwashing that goes on? Yes, it's insidious and subtle, and it's it's not. Every, it's like my brain is kind of wash resistant. I think I had a lot of experiences leading up to that that made me very skeptical of anybody using um, sexuality to be spiritual, which we won't get into. But but I did have That's some, for after the break. <laughs> yeah. That's for the subscribers only. Mm-hmm. I had some I had an immunity to that kind of tactic. But I did I can see how you get broken down. It's really erratic. The the exercises that Osho had you do, or in this case at this ashram, our our guru, it, it's you vacillate between emotions really rapidly. So mm-hmm. if you and I were doing an exercise, I would be, it's first it's like gibberish and then they ding a bell and then you start laughing like a crazy person like, ah, and then. That sounds then like acting class. It is like that acting does. class. They literally, I, I'm, I'm making a joke, but that is true. <laughs> no, they do this in acting this classes. This is another one of the immunities I <laughs> had. I was like, oh, this is like improv. I can do this. And then you just start, but then it dings a bell and then you start screaming at each other and be like, F you. And just by and you see that on the thing. There's yeah. this kind of, and it makes you crazy. It definitely mm. destabilizes your your emotional center. Sounds like explains every actor that I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> it it does remind me too. Like just, you're describing LA. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't. I don't. You didn't have to go to Australia. You know, no. <laughs> there's a lot going. You could have just gone to LA. Is a weird sex cult, isn't it? It is. I think so. I think there's, and there's so many cults in L.A. There are. I mean, I actually so know people who have joined cults in L.A. I mean, Scientology, A. Eh? The was biggest one the in biggest the world. One. Yeah. But there's um, one of the other, another investigative piece that I did was on orgasmic meditation. And as I did the piece and everybody kind of, any journalist who had written about it kind of drank the Kool-Aid. And I was like, am I the only one who thinks this is kind of weird? And I went and my therapist was like, be careful, Bridget, with your yeah. history. Like, this can be kind of triggering. Just be careful. And they didn't do, I was calling it Diddle Club because, <laughs> am I allowed to talk about this? Do we, do we, I don't know if we have to blank out Diddle Club. We'll see. We'll fix it in post. Yeah. I'm like, am I allowed to say Diddle Club? <laughs> And yeah, it's a it's a whole thing about being in the ohm of the and as I after I wrote the piece, I got emails from therapists up in San Francisco, which is where this thing started, of course. Right. And 
they were saying that they were so glad that I kind of, I was critical of it because they have clients who are suffering and nobody, I mean, there really should be like a full blown investigative report about this. It, it sounds exhausting. It, or, <laughs> orgasmic meditation, sex exhausting, <laughs> if you will, but that's, a, that's very tiring. How do you keep that up all day? I, don't, I, I was out after the first like <laughs> intro. <laughs> it's like, no. I, I'm going to avoid making all of the jokes that <laughs> are, you know, because it's a family show, but there are there's a lot to say. This reminds me of the famous triptych by Hieronymus Bosch, the garden of earthly delights, mm. where, you know, it's a famous triptych where it's paradise and it's beautiful. And then everyone's kind of having these sensual pleasures. And then it is hell on earth at the end. <laughs> it is just pure revelation, hell, you know, uh, you, you write in, in your piece about this excellent piece at Mel magazine, you write, were we just hedonists following our bliss or was there something evil lurking behind it all? Which is it and what's the difference? Oof. Well, I think the road to hell, it, you, it, anything can be perverted. I think you can go in with good intentions of being spiritual and wanting to connect to something higher. And I, I think that's why so many people end up in India or on these pilgrimages or in ashrams. You're not, you're not living the dream and mm. like, okay, I'm going to go check out and and you know, just go off the grid. I think there's an internal sense of restlessness or longing for a feeling of connection to something bigger. Mm. So it would be very easy to manipulate that for money or power or prestige or any of these things. And I think that you find these people in myself, I can only speak for myself, I kind of turned the other cheek to a lot of the stuff that was going on because I was just enjoying myself and ultimately on holiday and knew I was knew I was leaving. There were moments where I didn't want to leave because it was nice being there is something very natural about living that way. That's it's quite it, simple. So simple. You have no decisions to make because some swarthy little Indian millionaire makes them for you. Yes. And it's a, it, there's a nice routine and you're not wasting, you know, sometimes I'll like be pumping gas or I'll be, I'll be throwing a, a Starbucks cup away mm -hmm. and I'm like, this isn't sustainable. You know, there's this, <laughs> this, I'll go into Costco and it's like everything in here is going to end up in a landfill oh, or yeah. like coming, you know, how is this sustainable? That's how I meditate actually, is I just pour fossil fuels on the ground. And I think, ah, now I'm at peace. Om. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there is something kind of, uh, it's like a bit of a relief. Mm -hmm. I found that it was a relief. Uh, although I missed all of those earthly pleasures and, uh, and I wonder, cause you write about this in the Mel piece, you say, uh, that you missed civilization. Yeah. You met, you really liked the kind of simple sensuality, spirituality, simple, farming or whatever, but that you also missed like booze and yeah. opera and drugs and <laughs> nice food and meat and steak. And yeah. You eventually come back to civilization. Is it in your line about hedonism? Is it just the natural end of hedonism? Is this cultishness? It gives itself over to cultishness. And what is that boundary like? I think it does. I, I don't know. I don't know where you, where you go. It, you know, where I don't know where you end up at the end of hedonism other than searching mm -hmm. for something because it is so. I know where you go. It, it's all LA. It is. Yeah, I mean, it's the true. reason that the cults. You come to LA. You come to LA when you're already here and it's, you know, all of these cults pop up in the most hedonistic cities mm -hmm. in America. And I think it's because there are all these people in LA and you'll say, yeah, well, I'm a Catholic. Say, oh, you believe in that crazy superstition? That's ridiculous. Hold on, I just have to, <laughs> I have to move around my chakras because Mercury's in retrograde. I can't believe you believe in that crazy yeah. Catholic church. And it uh, often it's the the people who are not religious who are very hedonistic. They're the most superstitious people on earth. Oh, I mean, I feel this way about atheism. Even mm -hmm. it's the dogma of atheism. Like right. you guys really spend a lot of time telling me. Uh, preaching your atheistic values. It feels, if that, fe it feels the same way to me. I, I think we all want something to believe as humans the, because it's very confusing being human. Right. And I don't know much. I'm not that smart. I do know a lot about the human condition from my own experience. And the human condition, I think, is very confusing because there's this sense of order 
the sun rises, it sets, there are seasons, and yet there's all this chaos. And so that chaos, you want to make it make sense. You, you, that, that is the essential. I mean, Jordan Peterson just sold a gazillion books on this. The essential human motive mm-hmm. is to make order out of chaos mm-hmm. and, to, and to pursue the good, to pursue the virtue. Uh, so I wonder, you know, culture and cult come from the same word mm-hmm. they, to cultivate, right? They come from, they're both derived from the same thing. Which is worse, a wacky Indian sex cult in Australia <laughs> or our modern decadent, materialistic culture broadly in the West? Ooh. And it's interesting because there isn't much difference from the experience I had in at that ashram and working up on a farm in Oregon. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of overlap. The polyamorous and even in L.A., the culture here. And it leads, ult- which is worse, a wacky... I, some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, you know, there are a lot of... <laughs> Everyone's being exploited. So whether you're exploited for your breath work down here mm. or you're exploited for money on this ashram or or your, your psychology is... I think the dangerous thing that happens in places like ashrams as opposed to being in civilization is that your brain breaks in those places. And I definitely had friends that I'm still in touch with whose brains are a little bit broken from the ashram. They can't really exist in civilization and they don't really have a, a desire to because they haven't, they lost their, that socialization. Right. They, they're incapable of like the noise, they, the noise is too much and the chaos and the capitalism and. Well, you, you talk about it explicitly in one moment in the piece, you say they tried to, to give you a new name. Mm-hmm, they did. And that's, that's the moment where you thought, this is getting pretty weird, I fellas. Hope my, I hope that's what my name is here. Yeah. <laughs> Prem yeah. Sarita, guys. Prem Sarita, yeah. yes, of course, Premi. Yeah, yeah. You River bet. of Love. Yeah, <laughs> the River of Love. Mm-hmm. They gave you this new name. Is, this is just a cynical tactic to break your individual at, the And they do right? a lot of that. And I do think that that, I, I guess, did again, one of the differences, it's targeted breaking in an ashram, whereas here, maybe it's more insidious. Like, <laughs> LA just wears you down slowly right, in traffic right. and oh, yeah. just Broken battling dreams, everything. And... Absolutely unsatisfied. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm sorry. I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but there, it's very much forget who you are. The outside world doesn't matter. The you're going to disconnect from your family. They they don't need to hear from you. you you're isolated. Mm-hmm. So there's a big difference between any any situation, whether it's Scientology or the ashram or anything where it's isolating you from your friends and family and people that love you and mm-hmm. know you. That's even re- you see it in relationships. Right. I mean, I think Drew and I were joking. He's like, "Can't I just be a cult of one?" And I was like, "I think that's marriage." <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah that you're in it. You're the Bhagwan. You? Yeah. <laughs> I always refer to Drew Clavin as the Bhagwan. <laughs> you know, just the. Isn't yeah, that the, just what marriage is like? A cult of two. <laughs> that wow. That you know, you've really taken me full circle here, Bridget. <laughs> Initially, I just wanted to dive into a weird, sexy sitar laid in ashram. But now you've really now, made me. Real. I can be my own Italian you cult are leader. Joining a cult. I don't need to go to Australia to <laughs> oh. do that. I'll do it right in my own marriage. You can do it right in your own house. There's so much more I want to talk to you about, but we have to move on. I've got to get out of here. I want to talk to you. Oh, there's so much. Okay, we'll just have to have you back. Okay, Bridget. Thank you so uh, much. Pr- pr- Premi Pratram. Prem Sarita. Premi. Premi. Thank you for being thank here. Where can people me. find you? Oh, um, Twitter is the best. I'm on all all the socials, but at Bridget Fetacy is where I'm on. I live on Twitter. At Bridget Fetacy, don't we all? And I know we it makes. So I want to throw it and go follow the bog. I took it off my phone though. That's a good. I first recommend step. it. That's a good first step. Now okay. that I have this mug, I will never be working in Hollywood again. <laughs> you are done. You're gonna. The <laughs> I've Crips been are gonna, you, You've been Kanye. The Crips are gonna put a hit out on you. Actually, <laughs> so that's what happens. You, you're fine. not gonna believe the Crips, man. They, I was Kanye long before Kanye. That wow. Well. <laughs> Well, uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll be able to get some good uh, Trump tweets out of that. Hopefully you can avoid the Crips in the meantime. Bridget Fetacy, go find her on Twitter and read all of her stuff at The Federalist or, you know, Playboy is not a bad website to visit every once in a while. Mel Magazine is Mel great. Magazine, you write, writes everywhere. And all right, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Bridget. Okay, we've got to get and talk a little bit about the culture because, you know, we're talking about weird sex cults and now we can talk about our weird culture, which is absolutely in the gutter. There's some sad news that I want to get to about the culture today before we sign off and get to this day in history. Sad news about the culture is that we all hate each other. 
the, the Pew Research Center uh, j- just has a report out from last fall. It's being reported on now. The report shows, quote, among members of both parties, the shares with very unfavorable opinions of the other party have more than doubled. Uh, they've, they've increased by 28 full percentage points since 1994. Uh, Republicans and Democrats don't want to live in the same types of communities anymore. Most of them admit they have very few or no friends on the other side of the aisle. This is pretty weird. This is weird. And I, I've noticed it uh, even in my brief stint on this earth. The politics has gotten much nastier. And now if, if I go to a dinner or something and I say, oh, I'm Catholic or I don't know, I'm this or I'm, I have this belief or this belief, that is much more acceptable than saying I'm a Republican or I voted for Donald Trump. That you cannot say. It's very awkward. You have to hide it. Uh, you saw this in, in uh, voting patterns. This is why the polls weren't always so right, uh, public opinion polls about Trump support, because 20% of people don't want to admit it. Uh, 18% of people, I think also, acor- no, according to a, a national survey in Selena Zito's new book, show that people who voted for Donald Trump uh, don't want to admit it to others because they fear being ostracized. They fear losing their jobs, or their reputations, or their careers, or friends, or whatever. We know that lefties on Facebook are, are three times more likely than conservatives to unfriend people because of their political views. It's really angry and bitter. And I think it's because the, the culture has gotten shallower. So every everything is just shouting and yelling. And I don't blame the two sides equally for this. There's this really kumbaya thing. We say, you know, it's both sides, man. No, it actually is being driven by the left. Uh, conservatives sometimes take the, their cues or take the bait, but it, this is being driven by the left. It's being driven by poisonous ideologies like intersectionality, which say, hey, forget about our ideas, forget about our reason. We're going to gang up on this demographic because we don't like this group of people. It's a really a wicked ideology. And also you see it in uh, Jonathan Haidt's studies. Uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, published that famous study a few years ago. It was reported on the New York Times that conservatives understand the left more or less, but the left doesn't understand conservatives. They view the world in only three value categories. And they val- These things are all a little malleable, but the left views the world in narrower value categories and fewer value categories than conservatives view the world. So we can understand that point of view, but for instance, the left has trouble understanding something like purity the conservative value of purity. They say, who cares about purity? What are you talking about, man? I just want to live on my sex cult for my whole life or something like that. Uh, That's too bad. Usually the loudest voices are the least knowledgeable. That tends to be the case. And you hear people say, they say, I'm going to shout my abortion. I'm so proud. I'm going to shout this or shout that. I'm going to, you know, that girl, when Donald Trump won, there was that video of her and she's out there to say, Donald Trump won the election. She goes, no. And she yells and she screams because there's no reasonable discourse. Uh, if you, if you get angry and hot all the time, and you want to unfriend people and scream and yell. Usually that's a sign that you don't understand what you're talking about because I hear all sorts of crazy ideas all day long. I usually don't get that flustered because I've heard them before. Uh, That that owes to a bad education system, that owes to a highly politicized education system, and a vicious, shallow, highly politicized pop culture. Hopefully that's turning around. Bridget mentioned that she got Kanye'd. You know, Bridget isn't some Edmund Burkean conservative with buttoned up wearing tweed all the time, certainly not on the ashram, but she got Kanye'd in that she's a free thinker. And these days, if you're a free thinker, if you have independent thought, that puts you on the right. I I don't think people signed up for that, but the left has moved so far to the left, it just puts you on the right. This ties in with another sad phenomenon that's happening in the culture, and that's loneliness. There's an epidemic right now of loneliness in the culture. A new study from Cigna reveals that loneliness is at epidemic levels in America. This was a survey of 20,000 American adults aged 18 or older. Nearly half of those adults report sometimes or always feeling alone. 46% or left out 47%, depending on how you change the wording. Half of Americans report being sometimes or always lonely, feeling alone. One in four Americans, more than one in four, 27%, rarely or never feel as though there are people who really understand them, that they have no one who understands what they're going through, this total isolation for over a quarter of the country. Two in five Americans, 40% of the country, sometimes or always feel that their relationships are not meaningful. There are these shallow relationships, 43%, and, and that they're isolated from others, same percentage, 43%. This, I think, is because of the paltry view 
of friendship. And that comes because we've elevated sex. So we make sex the be all and end all. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to go to Australia or Oregon or India for that to happen. That is pervasive around the civilized world. There's a hookup culture. There, it's the swipe right culture. It's one that elevates sex. And I'm not denigrating sex. Sex is a cool thing, man. I'm all for it. But it's not the only type of relationship. There are plenty of other types of relationship. Uh, the, Aristotle wrote about friendship. Friendship is the important thing, the important relationship. And uh, I, it's, love has been described as two people looking at one another lovers are two people who look at one another and friends are two people who stand next to one another and look at the same thing. They're pursuing the same good. They're, they're observing the same good. And that kind of deep friendship I think is missing. It's missing in part because we're so afraid to talk about anything. You're, you're, people are afraid to talk about politics and religion. Don't talk about politics or religion at the dinner table, folks. That's, that's what we're told. It's because if I say, yes, I voted for Bob Dole in 96, they'll say, you vicious bigot, voting for a moderate Republican. So we're not really willing to talk about anything that matters. We're only willing to talk about dinner. We say, mm, this is good chicken. Mm, yeah. Mm. Oh, how's the chick? Chicken's good, right? That's all. People just talk about the food. Uh, that sh shallowness is, <laughs> is what makes people join wacky cults to search for something else because we know that's not sufficient in life. We want to have meaningful relationships. There was another big study that came out that said people hate small talk. I, you don't need a study to tell you that. Everybody hates small talk. People say, I want to go to this dinner because I'm going to have to yammer on and babble about nothing and over champagne or something. That no one, when people want to talk about things that matter. They want to think about things that matter. In the same survey from Pew, one in five people report that they rarely or never feel close to people. That were they, they feel like there are people that they can talk to. 20% say they don't ever feel close to people. There aren't meaningful relationships and it's because we uh, have humiliated the view of friendship. We've, we've made it so shallow that it barely exists. And uh, we've also destroyed the view of relationships. Now, you know, Cole Porter didn't sing, let's do it. Let's be in a relationship until one of us wants to get out of it and then we'll swipe right again. Right. That's not how the song goes. Let's fall in love. Let's give ourselves to one another. Uh, that view is, is on the decline. That's a minority view now, or it's a repressed view. And when you bottle something up for too long, it's going to come out in weird ways. This survey also shows that Generation Z, so a lot of times when people talk about the youths, they talk about the millennials, they say, oh, the millennials do this, the millennials do that. But actually the millennials are kind of old now. I'm a millennial. Millennials are late twenties, early thirties. Generation Z are the people who are up, upwards of 22 years old. Generation Z is reported to be the loneliest generation. Of all generations alive today, they're the loneliest. This is bizarre because you have the oldest generation alive. They should be the loneliest, right? Because all of their friends are dead or they're widowed or whatever. No, they actually are doing relatively better than Generation Z. And a lot of people blame this on social media use. They say, oh, it's because your, your heads are in your smartphones. You're not having meaningful relationships. That all might be true, but social media use, according to this survey, is not a predictor of loneliness. That's bizarre. The, the loneliness fares the same among heavy social media users and light social media users. What this means is, th this is partially what allows bizarre cults and rituals to flourish. This empty meanness and shallowness of materialism and abstracting things and saying, oh, well, I just, I think of this person as an abstraction. He's a Republican. He's a Democrat. He's a thisist or a thatist. And they think in only in terms of abstractions. So people are drawn to these weird cultish activities. People love farming. People love being with people. People love free love. They love uh, the tangible aspects of humanity, which in modern culture really doesn't uh, cherish as much, but it's, uh, it's an important aspect. And, and everybody's got to serve somebody there. You know, when, when, true religion goes away, people become very superstitious. They're, you can't avoid the metaphysical world. So you've got to channel these things into healthy ways or else people are just going to get meaner and meaner and lonelier and lonelier. And I'm going to have to move to Australia and join the sex cult. Okay. We've got a lot more to talk about because we have a, we have a bright side in this day in history. But before we get to that, I'm sorry, folks, we got to sign off. I've also got some pretty cool, there's some good news to announce. I think Ben might've announced it on Twitter this morning. Starting this Sunday, May 6th, Join the one and only Ben Shapiro in a brand new edition of his podcast, The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday Special. This is going to be really cool. We've been filming things uh, for this. Uh, ben will host a weekly in-depth conversation with the nation's uh, brightest and best people on politics, news, culture, 
everything in between. Uh, the first one is with Jordan Peterson. Jordan was by our offices uh, the other day. It's going to be really, really cool. The best part is for current Ben Shapiro Show subscribers, it'll just show up in the feed. It's just part of the Ben Shapiro Show. It's the new Sunday special. If you don't subscribe to the Ben Shapiro Show, I don't believe that because you're watching my show, which films in his broom closet. But in any case, you should subscribe to Ben's show. Uh, the Sunday special is going to be really, really cool. This will be the premiere episode, so I think you'll really enjoy it. In the meantime, you know, Daily Wire is on Apple News. I just got my first iPhone. I was on all these other fake iPhones for the last decade, and it is so much better. I'm, I'm going to join that cult. That's a wonderful cult. Uh, but we're on Apple News now, so subscribe to that. And listen, the last pitch before I say goodbye to you who aren't subscribing. Thank you for those who subscribe. You help us keep the lights on. You keep Kofefe in my cup. Go to dailywire.com right now. 10 bucks a month, $100 for an annual membership. What do you get? You get me. You get the Andrew Clavin show. You get the Ben Shapiro show. Sometimes you get British fetacy on my show. You get the conversation. You get the Sunday special. You get all this stuff, man, but none of it matters. This is what matters. Right now, we're going to have to get the Crip edition of the Leftist Tears Tumblr. The Crips are so sad that Kanye got kanye that he's tweeting out Thomas Sowell quotes, that Snoop Dogg's cousin, Dimalima Ding Dong or whatever, I didn't read, I don't know what his name is, but he told the Crips to put out a hit on uh, Kanye West. So look, all, that Crip edition of the Leftist Tears, that's going to be tasty and delicious. Because those guys, they put on a tough front, you know, but really, they, they can cry. Look, real men can cry. That's okay. So make sure you get your leftist tears tumbler or it will imperil your uh, life and your health. And I think my joking about the Crips has probably imperiled my life and my health. Go to dailywire.com. We'll be right back. Okay, we don't have a ton of time left, but happy law day. Happy Law Day, everybody. I, that might not be the day that you have been hearing about, but it is the 60th annual Law Day, which is perhaps the most American holiday. Uh, Law Day was proclaimed by Dwight Eisenhower, and Congress passed the resolution for Law Day three years later. Uh, this Law Day was first proposed by the American Bar Association in 1957. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Michael, this isn't Law Day. It's May Day. It's International Workers Unite Day. It's the Labor Day in all parts. Yeah, right. No, not in America, baby. Not in America. The reason that we passed Law Day uh, was to suppress May Day, which is a pagan holiday that was later appropriated by communists and became the International Workers' Day. So only in America, only in America could we take a pagan communist holiday and say, no, we're going to make it about following American laws. We're going to make it a day to celebrate the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They defined Law Day when it passed as a national day set aside to celebrate the rule of law. Law Day underscores how law and the legal process have contributed to the freedoms that all Americans share. A special day of celebration by the American people in appreciation of their liberties and rededication to the ideals of equality and justice under law. And... I think what went on said, the, the subtext of that was, and as a big screw you to the communists. And the, because May Day uh, was appropriated by the International Workers Day, which was created formally in 1904. It had, there had been allusions to it before that uh, by the Second International, uh, the com communist organization, calling on all social democratic party organizations and trade unions of all countries to demonstrate energetically on the 1st of May for the class demands of the proletariat and for universal peace. And what that is, is fantasy. It's a fantasy. That's, that's the difference between Law Day and International Workers' Day, is that the universal peace on earth, the utopia, we're going back to the Garden of Eden as long as I have to squish a few eggs to make an omelet and kill millions of people to uh, affect my utopian vision. But that's what we're going to have. That's a fantasy. That's the devil talking. And America has law day. That's the reality. Actual liberties protected by actual institutions and actual law. May 1st had been bubbling as a workers' day since the 1880s. So a lot of countries around the world celebrate this as a Labor Day. We don't do it because we, we put Labor Day in September, which is very lucky so we don't get swept up in all this commie worldwide celebration. And then uh, it wasn't always a communist holiday. May Day is a pagan holiday. May Day, you hear, you know, the Maypole ring. Uh, May Day is a pagan celebration of Floralia which is the, the goddess of flowers. It's an ancient pagan holiday. When Europe became Christian, May Day became either secularized or Christianized. So you'd have these secular celebrations, the start of, of summer, 
And you'd have these Christian celebrations. Uh, in Germany, they celebrate it as the feast day of St. Walburga. I, and I, I don't have any German viewers anymore after I did the show about how Germany is the worst country in the world. But for any of you who are still out there, happy St. Walburga Day. By the 18th century, this be, uh, turned into devotions to Mary. It's only one letter off, so May Day be, became a, a devotion to Mary, the Virgin Mary. In recent years, neo-pagans have brought back the ancient paganism of May Day. They've, they've started to bring it back as paganism, I think, is the fastest growing religion in America. Uh, there's when people get hedonistic, when people pretend that there's no true religion, they start to worship all sorts of superstitious things. And that this is a beautiful thing about America. We take pagan communist goop and we Americanize it. Christians have done this. Christians did this throughout the spread of Western Christianity. We would take pagan traditions and we would baptize them and make them Christian. So sometimes fundamentalists get angry. They say the Christmas tree was a pagan Germanic ritual. You say, right, but now it's a Christmas tree. That's a good thing. That's an improvement. That's a step in the right direction (laughs) when you take a pagan thing and you you subdue it and transform it into a Christian thing. Uh, Americans do this too. We we take holidays and we morph them into American holidays. We Americanize them. We don't negate. We just build and transform them. We build them up and we transform them. That's what we have to do in the culture because if we don't do that, if we allow, if, if we ignore the popular culture, then we're going to get run over by it. We're going to get hit by a bus. This is why some people are upset about Kanye West. They say, we shouldn't say nice things about Kanye because he's a crazy person and he might turn on us. Yeah, that's fine. But we can take that popular culture. I don't love rap music. I don't love hip hop. Surprise, surprise. But what you can take the little holds you can and transform it and build it. Does that mean Kanye West is going to button up and become an Edmund Burke conservative? I'm not putting money on it. But we can take what we have of that popular culture, Kanye West wants to be an independent thinker, a free thinker, be able to have his own say and protect his own liberties. Maybe Cardi B wants to keep a little bit more of her money. I don't blame her. She makes a lot of money. We take that and we can, we can use that. We can transform that. We can use that to build upon. And that, that's the American spirit. May Day, the International Workers' Day wants to tear down, tear down the hierarchies, tear down class structures, tear down civilization. And what America does is build it all up and make America great again. That's, that's a good way to celebrate. All right, that is our show. I will see you all tomorrow. Get your mailbag questions in for Thursday. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you then. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire forward publishing production. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Overa. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.